Our Hebrew scripture is from Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit, and set me down in the middle of a valley full of bones. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said, Mortal, can these bones live? Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these bones, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then God said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. The whole creation has been groaning in labor pains. And not only the creation, but we ourselves and our church groan inwardly. We groan while we wait for renewal and redemption. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. But we hope for what we do not yet see. We wait and welcome it. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit intercedes to the Holy Spirit, which searches for the heart, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Our Greek scripture is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are they not all Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I began sermon preparation this week by doing a little research. I asked a few folks because I wanted to know how do people here understand what is the Holy Spirit. And so I asked folks... What what is the Holy Spirit to you? What does it mean? And I, I got a lot of odd looks. 
and folks weren't quite sure. They weren't sure how to articulate what they wanted to say. They knew what the Holy Spirit was, but it was hard to put into words. Why? Because when we put things into words, it limits them, it contains them within the limits of human language. And of course, God is much bigger than any of our words could possibly describe. So they had a hard time defining the Holy Spirit. And so taking, taking a clue from Foucault, I decided to ask not what is the Holy Spirit, but what the Holy Spirit does. What does it do? And then it became a little more clear to folks. What does the Holy Spirit do? So that's our first question. And it seems to me like the first thing the Holy Spirit does is hint. It hints at us. Right? It gives us a little, you've heard this phrase, this, this small, still voice within. Yeah? The little, little voice that just gives little hints about what we should say or where we should go. But you know, that voice, that hint is soft and gentle and the world out there is loud and so a lot of times we don't hear the hint or rather we we might hear it but we choose not to pay too much attention to it so the holy spirit has to up the ante a little bit and the holy spirit inspires us increases the voice and inspires us to move and and many of us i i'm suspect that quite a few people in fact have had times in your lives in which you felt inspired to do something you you felt this is the voice of the holy spirit nudging me forward but yet there are these things i have to do there are these things happening in the world there uh, it's not easy for me things are not set up for me to do this whatever reason we may have felt inspired to do something but there are there are we decide that, that it's best just to stay where we are. So the Holy Spirit has to get louder. And the Holy Spirit drives. It drives us. Have we felt driven somewhere by the Holy Spirit? The second week I was with you, my second sermon here was on the transfiguration. And recall the scripture that uh, God looked down upon Jesus and declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the scripture says that immediately the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Didn't nudge him, didn't cause him to meander in, didn't think about it for a while. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness and so one conclusion is that the holy spirit drives us and drives us into new places new places our scripture last week taught us that god is unendingly creative that the creation hasn't stopped but that the love of God continues to create, causing new life to be born in this world, not just in the form of babies and new flowers and, and puppy dogs, but that the love of God creates by putting new life into us, even those of us who are up there in years, the Holy Spirit is breathing new life into us. The love of God is forever expanding in self-revelation. God is pouring out God's self upon the creation, bringing new life into being, inspiring us to do new things, to move to new places. And the Holy Spirit is that aspect of God which implants the seeds of new life into our world, which makes all things new, which enables all of us to be continually recreated into better and more faithful men and women, more useful men and women for the service of the kingdom. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Recall that it was the Holy Spirit, according to the scripture, that impregnated Mary with Jesus. And you may recall from last week's scripture that Mary went along with it. She agreed 
She consented, and so must we. We must agree. Why? Because God has given us free will, and the free will that is God's gift, God's gift of freedom means that we are not just moved around like chess pieces, that we're not on strings being moved around like God, like marionettes. No, God has given freedom to us as a gift, and so we can choose to not pay any attention to that voice, no matter how loud it is. We have to go along with it. We have to agree. And this is true for us individually, as we know that in each of us there is a new self waiting to be born. And it is true for us collectively, as a society, as a community. There is a new Hagerstown that is coming into being and it's true of this congregation, there is a new Christ Reformed Church waiting to be born, but we have to go along with it. We have to agree. We have to agree to be driven into a new space. But this is the good news. The good news that is that even things that seem dead and rotting, even people who appear to be beyond redemption, even those who seem to reject every teaching of God, people who obey the dictates of this world and follow its vicious, immoral logic, even these can yet live. Even the most morally and spiritually dead people can yet come alive. God breathes new life into dry bones. And so if only they consent they can come alive again. And this is good news because the Holy Spirit is the Ruah that breathes new life into dry bones. Ruah is the Hebrew word which means breath of life. And so when Ezekiel wrote about these dry bones, he used the word Ruah to describe that breath which is coming from heaven and blowing down new life into these dry bones. That is the Ruah, the breath of life. But look at that. Look at the bones. A sea of death and decay. These bones could not be useful to God or to God's people, but the love of God is such that nothing is beyond redemptive love. Nothing, no matter how dried and... and and disintegrating are the bones. Nothing is so dark and so dead and so decayed that, it, that the creative love of God cannot make something new emerge from the ashes and rubble of all of our mistakes, of all of our sin, both personal and collective sin, from the rubble of that sin, no matter how dark our world becomes, nothing can extinguish the love and light and salvation and redemption and renewal of our God. No one whom we perceive to be an enemy is really as hopelessly lost as we think. No one, no one is not loved and treasured by God himself. The passage from Ezekiel spoke to us of the dry bones of Israel. Recall that the Hebrew people had been taken away into exile. That means that Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah, took the elites, the wealthy and the educated people off and took them to Babylon where they were in exile for about two and a half generations. A new king, king came to the empire, Cyrus, and Cyrus let the people go in, a, in a, an infamous edict of 539. That's about 539 years before the birth of Jesus. Cyrus let the people return to their land, not just the Hebrews, but all of the people who had been colonized. They were allowed to return to their land. And so when the, imagine this now, returning to a land that had been destroyed 50 years prior, and what is there? Rubble, decay. The people come back and there's nothing left. The structures and the institutions of Hebrew life had been destroyed and the peoplehood was in a shambles. Some had assimilated while they were in Babylon and the peoplehood had no 
cohesive identity. There was no sense of who we are as a Hebrew people. They had to rebuild from the start. They had no temple. They had no cultural cohesion. The people needed hope. I imagine they felt like this. The sea of dead bones rotting and then blowing away into dust. I imagine that's how they felt. And I imagine that there are people sitting right here who feel like that. There's been some part of each of our lives which feels like it's rotting away. And yet, God tells Ezekiel, go and tell my people, tell my people that even these bones shall live, that I will breathe new life a ruah into these dry bones, and even these bones shall come and live. They shall come back together, and sinews and flesh and skin will be on them, and then I will breathe the ruah into them, and they will live. And it was the same ruah that breathed new life and faith and love and mission into the apostles of Jesus Christ. The Spirit empowered them and drove them out into the world, drove them to leave the safety of their own meeting space and to go out into the world where they were so urgently needed. The Holy Spirit drove them out of this room and scattered them into the world where they were to go and serve the people and preach the gospel and heal the sick. And yes, even raise the dead, Jesus told them. He said, what I have done, you will surpass in wonder. They were sent out into the world by the Ruah, the breath of life. Now recall that in biblical interpretation, we can assume that any lesson, any spiritual principle that God taught in the past also applies to us today. And we can assume that any spiritual principle which has to do with us individually, our individual spiritual life, also has to do with our collective life as a society, as a family, as a community, as a city, as a congregation, as a world. And so what would it mean if the Ruah were to breathe new life into this congregation? Or has it already? Is it even now breathing new life into dried bones? I'm going to tell you now a few, I'm going to list a few characteristics. Now, these, these are not things that relate to you. I'm talking generally. Generally, when congregations are in decline, there are a few characteristics. And so let's list a few characteristics of dying churches. First, they, they close in on themselves. They feel vulnerable, and so they think, oh, we have to circle the wagons, and let's, let's take care of ourselves, and let's focus on survival of this congregation. And so what they tend not to do then is to look out into the, neighbor, into the world where they are called to serve. So they become self-focused. Secondly, they tend to look backwards to an idealized past. They sort of choose a time in their collective memory, a time that seems to them to have been the perfect time when this congregation was strong and, and vital. They look to that time and then they think, let's go back to that time. So they try and reproduce things that were, happened at that time. And so, of course, the world has moved on. But instead of looking forward or looking to see what has God done in the world now and where are we called to go, instead of saying, where is the Holy Spirit driving us to go, they say, no, let's, let's go backwards, in fact. Let's ignore what's happening outside our doors and go back to that time. Third, they become fear-oriented, nervous. What are we going to do next year? 
how are we going to balance the budget? What happens if we, when our, our collection starts to decline? How are we going to keep, how are we going to pay this light bill? How are we going to fix the furnace or whatever? And so the fear then is what drives them rather than love and faithfulness. They become fearful and averse to risk. They don't want to take any risk. No, we can't do that. We just got to hang on to what we have. And so instead of being driven somewhere new by the Holy Spirit, they want to go back to that time. And finally, internally, they become negative. They start to have conflicts with, the, with each other. Their systems of leadership become dysfunctional. They start to fall apart. That's what happens to congregations that are dying. But this congregation has not done those things. This congregation has not fallen into that trap. This congregation still has life left. This congregation has not turned in on itself, but continues to look out to, into the world where we are driven to go. I can tell you that the elders are in process of a discernment process, discerning what kind of congregation you feel called to be in the future. And they're about one third of the way through that process. And already I can tell you that the majority of the results, the majority of the elders said, we are called to be more engaged with this neighborhood right around us. Most of the elders know we need to be out there in the world, not just in ourselves. So this congregation has not fallen into that trap of turning in on itself. This congregation is looking forward. It knows that there is something new and it's willing to change. How many people have said, yes, we know we need to change. You're willing to change, and that means you're not going to be like those dry bones. You're going to be like those vital, alive servants of God, and that is good news. And this change, of course, does not wait until the new pastor comes. The fifth characteristic of congregations that are dying is that they look for a new pastor to come and be their savior. Well, we'll get a pastor who will help us grow. And within a year, they've closed. This congregation knows better than that. You know that, you, that the change does not wait for the next pastor, but the change happens now. You start now doing that. And so this congregation will not disintegrate into dry bones, but will march into the world just like the apostles at Pentecost. We'll march into the world faithful, full of hope, full of vitality. I know that that is what is happening here. I know that there is a ruah in this space and in this congregation. I can feel it, and we can all feel that there is something new being born inside this church, and it is about to burst forth into the world in a new and powerful way. And that is good news. And all we have to do is say, okay, God, let's do it. Amen.